Hello, my name is Paul Struthers, Frameline's Director of Exhibition and Programming. Welcome to our inaugural virtual screening in partnership for friends at the Roxy Theatre, featuring a film from our own catalogue from director John A. Biren, No Secret Anymore, The Times of Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon. In light of her recent passing, we've prepared a special tribute to Phyllis Lyon, commemorating her life and work featuring very special guests, Kate Kendall, Joe Gomez, and Joan E. Beren. We are pleased to donate 100% of net ticket sales from this event to the GoFundMe campaign to save Lyon Martin and Women's Community Health Clinic, a clinic serving low-income and underinsured transgender and cisgender women. Elizabeth Sakara, former clinic director and head of the fundraising initiative, to save it, joins us in the tribute. This is the first of several virtual screens we've planned for you, part of our new initiative, Frameline Play, which brings Frameline films to you in the safety and comfort of your home and makes our films and community accessible for everyone, everywhere, anytime. Without further ado, here's to the life and times of Phyllis. Our first tributarian is Kate Kendall, the former executive director of the National Center for Lesbian Rights. So first of all, I want to thank Frameline for reprising and rescreening No Secret Anymore, the life and times of Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon as a tribute, particularly to Phyllis in the wake of her death last week. Phyllis was a force of nature, both of them, made a huge difference in the lives and the futures of LGBTQ people in this country. And I feel very honored that I knew them both, uh, counted them as mentors and friends and colleagues. And particularly after Dell died in 2008, I got really close to Phyllis. Um, she was so moved and grieved by Dell's death it was evocative and illustrative of how deep a connection they had over the course of 54 years. Of course, everyone remembers one of the key highlights of the life and times of Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon, and that is when they married for the first time in 2004 at City Hall. This was when then Mayor Gavin Newsom made the decision to begin issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples. And we decided that Dell and Phyllis had to be the first couple to marry. And I got the honor of calling them and asking them if they would be willing to be the first couple married by the city and county of San Francisco. And I remember, remember, and I remember vividly Phyllis answering the phone. I told her what we needed. Dell and I heard her put the phone down and I heard her talking to Dell and she came back about 15 seconds later and said we'll do it and that picture that iconic photo of them marrying at City Hall was a picture seen around the world and it ignited the modern movement for the right of same-sex couples to marry and it, it evoked the love and commitment that is emblematic of so many of our relationships. They married that day, celebrating their 50th year together as a couple. 50th year together as a couple. What of course we most owe to Dell and Phyllis was that at a time of tremendous peril in the 1950s, they founded the first ever lesbian organization, the Daughters of Belitis, a social organization where women could know each other and come together well before social media or the ubiquity of cell phones and the ability to connect with people immediately. And yet the Daughters of Belitis and the magazine that they published, the latter, became a way for women all over the country and in fact the world to find each other and connect. And in that connection was power. In that connection were the seeds, the early seeds of the modern movement for radical change and for 
the change in civil society to fully protect and honor and recognize the dignity of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. I saw Phyllis a couple of key times over the course of the last few months. One was on her 95th birthday on November 10th of 2019. Joyce Neustadt, who used to be Mayor Newsom's policy director, and I took Phyllis out for an afternoon to celebrate her birthday. Now, by this point, Phyllis had descended pretty well into dementia, and yet she never didn't make you feel like she knew that you were somebody important to her. She may not have known my name, but she made me feel like she loved me and she knew I loved her, and that she never lost. And even though throughout that day, celebrating her birthday, we had the same conversation innumerable times. Phyllis, it's your birthday today. Wait, it's November 10th? How old am I? Phyllis, you're 95. Oh my gosh, I'm 95. We had this conversation many, many times. And at one point we had the conversation again and Joyce said to her, yes, you're 95. And her response was far out. So that joy, that kind of childlike wonder always a hallmark of Phyllis and it was there up until her death. The last time I saw Phyllis was in February. It was February 14th. That was her and Dell's anniversary and it would have been I think their 62nd anniversary as a couple. Joyce and I went to visit Phyllis at the home that she and Dell purchased in the mid-1950s up at the top of Castro Street in San Francisco, and they lived in that house together until Dell's death, and Phyllis lived there until her death. We sat in the living room and we reminisced about Dell. Phyllis always remembered Dell. And we talked about what was going on in the world. In other words, batshit crazy. This was before COVID, just before COVID had really hit. And Joyce presented Phyllis with a House resolution that Speaker Nancy Pelosi had delivered on the floor of the House in honor of Phyllis's birthday. Phyllis listened to the proclamation and teared up a bit, as all three of us did, and was just so moved. She knew, she still knew, and could hold on to that she was somebody really important who had really made a difference. And the fact that she died knowing that she really that difference is tremendous comfort, even though we will all miss her very much. And while I'm not a particularly religious person, I have no doubt that she and Dell are finally reunited, dancing and drinking and laughing with a whole host of friends somewhere. And that gives me great joy. Next, we have the author, poet, critic, and playwright, Jewel Gomez, sharing her remembrances of Phyllis and Dell. Hi, I'm Jewel Gomez, and uh, like most lesbians of my age, I will say Phyllis and Dell saved my life. Um, and that's, that's pretty true, uh, I, although I did not meet them until much later in my life. Um, so the first thing that I will tell you that contributed to my life saving was when I was in undergraduate school in Boston, where I grew up, the local arts newspaper came out every week and it was free. And in the back was a, a classified ad for DOB. And it had a phone number you could call and get instructions to where the DOB meeting was happening. And I never went. I was too anxious about it, really. I mean, as a young color girl uh, in Boston, I was too anxious about going out to a place where it was going to be all white women that I didn't know. I presumed it was all white women and um, that I wouldn't know them. And that's how isolated one felt as a lesbian in uh, the 60s and uh, 70s. So... I lived with that anxiety a good bit of my life 
except for those days when that newspaper came out and I held that ad in my hand. It was like a lifeline. I knew that there were people out there that I could find if I needed to and when I needed to. That was really, really important to me. Uh, the other thing that was interesting before I met them was I worked as a researcher in New York on the film Before Stonewall, which is a documentary about gay activism and gay life before the Stonewall uh, Rebellion. And I had a great time. I learned a lot. Greta uh, was the director of the film. Greta Schiller was the director. Andrea, Andrea Weiss was the research director and she uh, was great. They both helped me learn about researching for documentaries. I really had a great time, except one of the staffers, one of the other staffers was in charge of lining up Phyllis and Dell for an interview for Before Stonewall. And I don't know what he did. I don't know what he said, but they decided they did not want to be in the film. And that was kind of a shocker. And uh, Greta had to figure out how to make a film about the movement without two key people, uh, which she did. And Before Stonewall is a really important document of uh, LGBTQ activism. But I learned that men in general and even gay men, if they don't know about something or someone, their assumption is that that's not important for them to know about. And I was uh, furious and it was very upsetting to me, but I did learn that it was important to make up your own mind to do something or not do something. And you could do that as a lesbian, as a lesbian activist, you could say, no, that's fine, go right ahead. Good luck to you, I'm not doing that. And that was a big deal. That was a big deal for me to learn, uh, you know, coming right out of uh, college and, and uh, living on my own. Um, I moved to the Bay Area in the early 90s, and I got to meet Phyllis and Dell, and it was incredibly emotional for me because how often do you get to tell people who've changed your life how much they've changed your life? And they were great about it and really warm and... They were busy. They were still busy activists in their older years. They were participating in many, many things that were still helping to change queer people's lives. And I use that as an example still today for how I want to be uh, all of my life. When uh, I got to see where they lived, which was a sweet little cottage uh, up many, many steps, I... I thought, oh, okay, activism. Activism is their lives. They're regular people and at the same time bigger than life. And so I, I wanted to, to pay attention to that, how they manage their lives, both public and private. Um, then Dell passed away. And it was hard to imagine Phyllis without Dell. You know, Phyllis and Dell was like saying salt and pepper. Uh, they were a unit in a way, and Phyllis went on. I mean, she was a, still a powerhouse. I mean, she was older and, you know, very um, physically energetic most of the time. You know, the governor, Gavin Newsom, came to say happy birthday. Um, you know, it, she was a, she was a, a dynamo, really. Um, and I felt bonded with her. She and I bonded over being high femmes and because femmes often get dismissed, you know, it's like, oh, what are you doing? Are you really an activist? Look at you. You're wearing lipstick. Um, and this kind of retro way that people had about women. Um, and of course it was all about sexism. So we bonded over that because Phyllis was definitely a high femme and she was activist to the hardcore. We also bonded over enjoying, you know, baseball. That was great. Um, and even without Dell, Phyllis kept up a busy social calendar 
And in 2008, she came to me and Diane's wedding, which was at the Hormel LGBTQ Center at the San Francisco Public Library. And I can't say how much it meant to be uh, there talking about ancestors because our wedding was on November the 1st, Day of the Dead, and it was the theme was ancestors and to be talking about the importance of ancestors in our lives today and look out and see Phyllis was so powerful to me, to both of us. And Phyllis was a joy. She was a celebrator of all things celebratory, whether it was a rally or a wedding. And so it, it meant the, it meant everything to us and it really uh, was an honor to have to have her there. Uh, Phyllis was well suited to being an icon because uh, she was really smart. She loved to drink a nice glass of wine. Uh, she was politically savvy. She was glamorous. She was quick-witted and really tough. And of all the things I learned, being tough was the most important for me. I think it's hard sometimes for women to be tough. Sometimes people get annoyed with you because you're tough. Why is she so tough? And you know they like to use that B word. Uh, but I learned from Phyllis it was good to be tough. Put on that lipstick, go out there, and be tough and know what you're doing. So it meant a lot to me to have that experience with her close up. And as a writer of vampire uh, stories, I like to think that Phyllis will live on forever. We are blessed to work with our next guest often, as we have a number of her films in our catalog, including A Simple Matter of Justice and For Love and For Life. And of course, our feature presentation, No Secret Anymore, The Times of Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon. Please welcome renowned documentarian of the LGBTQ plus rights movements, John E. Barron. Hi. Phyllis and Dell showed me how much you can get done when you don't care what other people think. Their strong sense of self and self-worth made it possible for them to face down the hatred of homosexuals when other people were hiding and running away from it. I mean, people were saying, you're sick, you're immoral, and Dell and Phyllis would look them right in the eye and say, no, we're not. And I think uh, it's kind of <laughs> astonishing uh, still. And um, that, that same powerful confidence that allowed them to do all the wonderful things they did also made it really easy to make a film with them. You know, a lot of documentarians have a problem uh, with the main people in their film trying to control the narrative. And uh, before we started making the film, I uh, went to Dell and Phyllis and I said, you know, is there anything you want to tell me? Is there anything specific I should uh, know? And, and they looked at me and their very um, definitive way and they said, well, we don't want it to be boring. <laughs> you know, it, it would be really hard to make a boring film about people who are so fierce and, and so funny. And the, they uh, embraced who they were, uh, flaws and all, in each other, in themselves, and they were not afraid to show the world who they were. So it was just a, a, a wonderful, easy, and pleasurable way to be in control of my own film. And, um, you know, uh, Phyllis and Dell started and sustained so many, organiza so many organizations during their lifetime that I, I couldn't even 
mention all of them in No Secret Anymore. They, and they got all sorts of awards while they were alive. And eventually, they had so many plaques they didn't even have room on the walls of their very small house to display all the plaques. But there was one honor that they especially treasured. You know, they didn't start Lion Martin Health Services, but when the people who did chose to name it after them, they really, really loved that. And Lion Martin Health Services serves communities today that could not even have existed if Phyllis and Dell had not done the work that they did in the 1950s and 60s and 70s and 80s and into the 90s and 2000s because they just never stopped building community, inclusive community. And that's who is served by Lion Martin Health Services. So I think Phyllis and Dell deserve a living legacy. And so if you can, I hope you will contribute to Lion Martin Health Services now when they need it to survive. Dell liked to joke that um, it was easy to remember her anniversary because it was on Valentine's Day. And on their 50th anniversary, actually the, the day before their 50th anniversary, we premiered No Secret Anymore at the Castro Theater and celebrated them, their 50th anniversary. There were lots and lots of friends and family and politicians and all kinds of folks who wanted to be there to party with them. And it was a, a wonderful, wonderful day. And then I had the privilege of spending basically the next year taking the film all across the country and around the world and sharing the delight of people getting to know Phyllis and Dell through the film. And honestly, it was one of the best years of my life. It was so much fun. So I would like all of you to um, just Imagine, because this is actually what we're doing, that we're having a virtual global film festival right now and uh, seeing No Secret Anymore, The Times of Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Elizabeth Sakara, a former director of the Lyon Martin and Women's Health Clinic about Phyllis's legacy and the ongoing efforts to save this vital community resource. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Sakara, and as the previous director for Lion Martin Health Services, I had the opportunity to see the legacy of Phyllis and Dell changing lives every day while gaining a hilarious and outspoken friend in Phyllis Lyon. Phyllis and Dell created a physical and societal place for lesbians to feel visible and to have self-determination as a possibility for what our lives could look like. Lion Martin Health Services continues this work through providing health care to women, lesbians, transgender, and non-binary individuals who deserve a safe space to receive health care, as well as many programs that advance this work within healthcare across the country. Knowing Phyllis for the past 12 years has been a gift that has impacted me personally in so many ways. The life of Phyllis and Dell are the foundation that allow me to be who I am today as an out queer person working in healthcare, while raising two kids with my partner of 20 years who is an out trans man. Through the process of Phyllis's passing, my internal fire has been stoked to change healthcare for LGBTQ plus people at the local, state, and national levels. I want to honor the life of both Phyllis and Dell 
through ensuring access to culturally competent care so people can self-determine what their life looks like for themselves. In these uncertain times, it feels life-giving to be able to have a purpose beyond myself and to help raise the voices of those who need to be heard. There are still so many within our community who do not have access to affirming health care that heals. I am sure there are many of you who have experienced the demoralizing doctor's visit that made you feel invisible by your health care providers because while you were seeking out care, your identity was not taken into consideration. This is why Lion Martin must exist. We must continue to serve as an example of what care should look like across the country for us or else we risk losing this relevant institution of our collective community identity. There is a group of individuals called Save Lion Martin who are dedicated to working with Lion Martin Health Services and HealthRight360, which is their parent organization, to create a path forward, ensuring that Lion Martin can receive the stability and resources it needs far into the future. Currently, Lion Martin is looking at imminent closure or consolidation unless we are able to secure funding to allow us the time necessary to find a permanent home. Lion Martin is healthcare by the people and for the people, which is the only model that works for those who have been harmed by the system. Through keeping these services alive, we are taking a stand and saying that our community matters and deserves to be held in its diverse beauty, instead of trying to make us all fit into systems that were not made for us. Please consider making a donation to Save Lion Martin and help us keep this clinic around for another 40 years, continuing to serve as a beacon of hope for those across the U.S. and within our city limits who come to find their health and well-being within our four walls. If you can't give a monetary gift, that's fine. You can also make a big impact by joining our letter and call campaign to the mayor's office to let her and City Hall know how important these services are. All of these actions can be done by visiting our website at www.savelionmartin.com. Again, that's www.savelionmartin.com. I want to thank Frameline for raising awareness and funds for our work and for being a beacon in their own right for providing a voice and a venue for our com beautiful community. I hope each of you watching this film feel inspired by the life story of Phyllis and Dell and let it fuel your own passion for change whatever that may be. This is how we carry forth Dell and Phyllis's legacy and honor them while giving the same hope and opportunity they bestow to us, to the change makers that are just discovering who they are. Thank you. Hi,